Hey folks, Nathan here. Welcome to Nate's Favorite Deck Building Games. This time we take a look at another of these legendary deck building games, only this time it's not legendary Marvel, it's legendary Buffy the Vampire Slayer. A game that really is still considered one of my favorites, specifically because it does use those legendary mechanics. Think of this as essentially a variant on that theme. As such, there won't be a whole lot to talk about as far as new mechanics or anything for this game, so I will assume you've already seen the episodes about the legendary deck building game so that we don't have to go through all the rules this time. But for those of you who are interested in games of a similar vein, we do have a legendary Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Now bear in mind that this is different than a legendary Encounters game. The Alien and Predator games, for instance, that I'll eventually show you, those are considered legendary Encounters. They have somewhat more complicated rules and have certain aspects to them that are different than the Marvel game, or this game for that matter, but which are somewhat consistent across that product line. That is not the case here. This one is legendary only, so it will play basically like the Marvel one. So let's take a look and see what we have. One thing you might notice here if you're very sharp-eyed is that I did just have to raise up the tripod here in order to show you the entire play map because Legendary Buffy the Vampire Slayer, as with many of the Legendary Encounters games, has a slightly bigger playmat than what we're used to for a Marvel Legendary game. We have a spot here for our twists, scheme twists in this case, scheme, escape villains, same so far, strikes, or master strikes in this case, the big bad, which is essentially their equivalent of the masterminds or the commanders from Marvel Legendary, courage, which is new, Potential Slayer, new, but a type of always available card. We've seen that type before. Wounds, Bystanders, the Villain deck, and the Hero deck, all of which are familiar. We have our Library, equivalent to Headquarters. We have Sunnydale, equivalent to the City, but we also have some unique notifications for a couple of the different spots within Sunnydale. And then we have something entirely new for this set, which is our light and dark track over here off to the side. We'll take a look at uh, all the new mechanics relating to this and those equivalent groups and what we actually get within the box for those who are curious about Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Of course, to start with, we should note that you do, of course, have a detailed rule book to help you get through the game. And it's pretty succinct. After so many Marvel Legendary games, they're pretty good at putting out a rule book that gives you everything that you need but also doesn't overly delve too much into the minutia so you can jump into the game fairly quickly. First let's look here at a couple of new token types that are just used with this game that do not have a connection for Marvel Legendary. First we have these. These are courage tokens. You start out with one and essentially during your turn you can spend one to be able to get one more recruit point or one more attack point to use for recruiting or attacking during that turn. And over time, different game effects will cause you to gain courage tokens. So in theory, you could spin them all at once or bit by bit as you go, as they do carry over between turns and can be earned throughout the game. Probably the most useful aspect of this is to hoard a bunch of them and then use them when the time comes to take out your big bad, which again is this game's equivalent of a mastermind. On our light and dark track, we also have another new token, the Vampire Tome here, which is essentially just our little token to track the light or dark level within Sunnydale as we're playing. It starts on dark one at the beginning of the turn. Again, we'll take a look at exactly how that works momentarily. First though, let's take a look at the different card types and what we get in terms of those. Now I've moved our courage tokens over here, at least a few of them, because that is where they would stay. That's actually not a card space, it's a token space there, just to have a repository of them. But we start out with having our starting decks for each individual player. And just like with what we got with Marvel Legendary, it is a split of eight of one card that gives you recruit and four of one card that gives you attack, all of them with one value for either recruit or attack. But instead of our shield agent and shield troopers, we have watchers and we have initiative soldiers. We then have our wounds that play the same as they do in Marvel Legendary. We have 30 of those. And at this point, just like early on in Marvel Legendary, 
There's just the one type, so they all go face up rather than face down over there in the wound stack. We then have a total of 30 bystanders, but just like in the later sets for Marvel Legendary, we're going to put it face down because they're not all the exact same card. Um, we'll start here. This is a promo card here. Dingo's Ate My Baby. Then uh, Billy Ford Fordham. Clem. Lily. Joyce Summers. Herbert the Pig. And Dawn Summers. Which then brings us back around to where we started. Again, you'd shuffle all these and they would wind up in your bystander stack face down. We then have eight schemes to choose from to go in our scheme spot here. We have Epic Struggle, Hellmouth Opening, Road to Damnation, Summon the Uber Vamps, Twilight Terror, Vile Agenda, Convert to Evil, and Darkness Falls. Again, just one of them would wind up being selected or randomly chosen to go there in our scheme slot. Then, of course, as we play, we'll be doing some scheme twists, and the game includes 11 of those that, after being played, would go over there in our twists pile. We will also be dealing with our big bads, like masterminds, being able to do master strikes. So the game provides us with five of those, which, again, once used, would wind up in our strikes stack over here. Mine's a little bit curved up because I haven't played with this one quite as much as Marvel Legendary. Our always available pile, kind of like the shield officer back in Marvel Legendary, is going to be the potential slayer. And these go face up because they are all identical. They each give us two recruit for a cost of three recruit. It says instead of playing this, you may discard it to advance the light. So that's one of the instances in which you are manipulating the light and dark spectrum over here for Sunnydale that we'll talk about a little bit more here momentarily. But these potential slayers and always available cards specifically connected to the new mechanic in this set is going to be over here in our potential slayer stack face up. Then, of course, we have our big bad, which is the equivalent for Marvel Legendary of either a mastermind or commander in the villain set. And each one, just like with Marvel, is going to have a card specific to that villain, the big bad or the mastermind card, and then four tactics, in this case, big bad tactics, to go along with them that you have to defeat in order to win the game. I would note here that the Big Bad is single-sided, no epic version or transform version on the back like we saw in some of the later Marvel Legendary sets. So we have Glorificus, the First, Angelus, the Mayor, and the Master. And one in play at a time, they'll be in that big bad stack over here. Now, as we start getting into our heroes, I did want to point out that we do have some specific factions again and specific types again. So, for instance, the Watchers and your starter deck, that is the Watchers faction, or heroic team, as they call it in this game. And then we also have the Initiative there on your Initiative soldiers and other cards, but that's the first time you'll see it when playing the game. Then, with our potential Slayers and many other cards, we have the Slayers Heroic Team icon. We also have the symbol for the Scoobies. And Supernatural. Our Hero Classes, like that symbol there, the classes are the same for the most part. Uh, strength, Instinct, and Covert Heroes are called the same thing they are in Marvel Legendary. But Marvel's tech heroes become knowledge heroes here, and the ranged heroes from Marvel become magic heroes here. But the symbols are the same as they are in Marvel. It's just their meaning that has changed, though not significantly because you still use the symbols to figure out your combos. So who are the heroes this time? Well, among the Slayers, we have Buffy Summers, Faith Lahane, and the First Slayer. For the Supernatural Heroic Team, we have Angel, Anya Jenkins, Daniel Oz Osborne, and Spike. Everybody you'd expect. For the Initiative, we have Riley Finn. 
For the Watchers, as expected, we have Rupert Giles. And then we have several for the Scoobies, including Jenny Callender, Cordelia Chase, Willow Rosenberg, Tara McClay, and Xander Harris. Then we also have one hero that actually has no heroic team, but does have classes on the cards, which is the Buffy Bot. So our typical 15 different heroes, each of which has 14 cards, one of which is rare, three of which are uncommons, and five of which are common, along with another five that are also common, as we've come to expect. Then we've got our villain groups, which in this case are seven different villain groups of eight cards each. The eight cards each is pretty much expected. We have the villain group Demons, Mayor's Minions, Glory's Minions, Order of Aurelius, the Scourge of Europe, the First's Minions, and Harmony's Gang. And lastly, that leaves us with one other card group to take a look at, which are the Henchmen. This time we have five Henchmen, and as usual, there are ten identical cards in each one. We have the Turrican Vampires, Shark Gangsters, Vampire Initiate, Hellhounds, and finally, Harbingers of Death. Okay, so let's talk new mechanics. All right, first off, we've already mentioned these Courage Tokens. You start out with one, you can earn them along the way, you can spend them to get plus one attack or plus one recruit at some point during your turn, and you can carry them over from one turn to another. So an example of the type of card that would let you also earn this during regular gameplay would be something like Spirit Guide here for the first Slayer, where it says, draw a card, gain a Courage Token. There are also cards that reference Courage Tokens and the number that you have to help you do certain things. For instance, we have uh, Anya Jenkins here with the uh, Back in the Vengeance business, the Anyanka card here, where it says, do one of the following based on your Courage Tokens. Zero to three, gain three Courage Tokens. Four to seven, defeat a villain in Sunnydale. Eight plus... Defeat the big bad and lose half of your courage tokens rounded up. So, in that case, hoarding your courage tokens is particularly useful. As another mechanic here, which we have seen in Marvel Legendary, I would quickly note that yes, there are some cards that use that double icon for doing combos where you have to have played two of the type instead of one. But of course, the biggest difference is this light and dark track over here. And the idea is that as you play, certain things are going to change where the marker is, where the token is, on this sliding scale. Sometimes it's mandatory, sometimes it's not. For instance, here with Faith Lehane and her Want, Take, Have card, it says draw a card. You may advance the dark. If you do, you gain plus one attack. So she can choose to advance it from one to two or from two to three for advancing the dark or from three here, which we'll talk about in a moment, but that is an optional thing, at least in that case. We've already looked at the potential Slayer, but again, instead of playing this, you may discard it to advance the light. That would move it up the scale here. Some cards will make reference to the actual number over there on the track. Uh, in this case, Hard Fought Redemption. You get plus attack equal to the level of the dark. So one, two, or three, depending on where the token is or zero if it's in the light somewhere. You have other cards that specifically reference whether it's on the light or dark side of that track. So in this case with Slay Master General, if it's in the dark area, and this is kind of like the night and day to some degree uh, of Ascension War of Shadows, we have if it's in the dark area, so dark one, two, or three, you get plus five attack and advance the light twice, which moves the light up by two. Or if it's in the dark, it moves it up the scale by two. It's a sliding kind of scale here. It just starts at dark one. You have some cards that reference each. So depending on which side it's on, that gives you an ability. In this case, here, of course, Spike makes perfect sense for him to be someone who's on both light and dark with his abilities. The light side is KO a card in your hand or discard pile. The dark is draw a card. So whichever side it's on, he gets a benefit, just a question of what. 
You can also see advancements during regular gameplay even without a card that references it. If any villain makes its way from the Hellmouth all the way to the cemetery and then continues on to escape, one of the penalties, along with the discarding card and whatnot, one of the penalties for escaped villains is that you advance the dark by one. Also, on the other hand, when you fight in downtown or Sunnydale High, both of them are marked up above, fight, advance the light. So just fighting a battle in that location advances the light by one. Now you might say, what if it's already at one of the extremes? What if it's already at three or at three? What happens next? Well, if I'm sitting at light three and something happens that would advance the light again by one, I gain a courage token. Right? And then it says move to light one. It resets back to one, but is still on the light side. With dark, same thing, sort of. One, two, three. If it's time to advance it again and it's already on three, then it triggers the big bad dark, which we're about to look at, and we move it to dark one. Again, stays on the same side, but moves from three or beyond back to one. Now, what does it mean by triggering the big bad's dark? It's kind of like when a master strike gets pulled and you read the master strike part of your big bad card. In this case, each of these not only has an always leads and a master strike, but has a dark section. And when you hit that big bad dark, which is not just that it is dark, but that you've been at three and advanced off the end of it here, then you trigger whatever the dark says. So in this case, his master strike is advance the dark, each player discards a slayer or gains a wound. But dark is each player gains a wound and places it on top of their deck. Okay, so something negative will happen depending on which big bad card it is once you advance this too far. So it's sort of a, a balance of trying to make sure to stay in the light if you can, but also finding a way to use where it is on the spectrum to your advantage during play. Beyond that though, you're really just looking at a game that basically plays like Marvel Legendary. So if you're into Buffy the Vampire Slayer and you want a complex, but not the single most complex deck building game out there, and you want to be able to get into it and actually see these familiar characters and situations at play, then check out Legendary Buffy the Vampire Slayer. It's also good if you're a fan of Marvel Legendary, as you would probably imagine, because it'll be very easy to pick up and play. Bear in mind, though, that it is based on Buffy, not Angel. So hopefully someday they'll do either an Angel expansion or a separate Angel game, but I'm not holding my breath at this point. If you want something really complex, you're going to need to jump to Legendary Encounters, but the Legendary games are significantly more complex than most of the ones that we look at. So this might not be great for beginners into deck building games, but it's certainly one that anyone with a moderate bit of experience with deck building games or some patience can jump into.